So, good afternoon. I think we'll still say everybody. So happy to see many of you. Welcome to today's Utsan talk. Today we have a very special visitor, Mr. Enrique Soberano from Neto Soberano Architectus. Architectos, right, in Spanish. I try to say it in Spanish. I think you'll do better, Enrique, than I, I did. But Enrique, thank you very much for visiting us. Uh, we have looked very much forward to your visit. Uh, Neto Soberano Architectos have made a contribution to our uh, exhibition we have right now called We Love from Spain, and uh, we are very happy to have you. So I will give you the word, Enrique, and you can tell us more about your works and the way you work with architecture. Now? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this invitation, and I'm happy to be here. I have to say again, though not here in the Hudson Center, but I was already in an Hudson lecture many years ago, uh, and it was just before this building was finished, or something like that. I could not exactly remember, but it was a seminar on Hudson uh, with many international in, uh, you know, guests, and, and I had the, you know, the pleasure of being here. Though uh, now I have uh, the pleasure is double because I, I was able to see this building um, in reality. Yeah? To me, it's quite a, an interesting and important question, I have to say, from a personal point of view, when I look at uh, our career in the distance. Yeah? Because actually, um, we started very soon to be interested in the work of Jorn Utzon. <clears throat> this is something that happened to us, uh, one could say by chance, but the chance is always connected to the way one works and, and, and studies. And in our case, we, we, we went to study after studying in Madrid to the United States, to Columbia University. There was our professor, Kenneth Frampton, and Kenneth Frampton gave a brilliant lecture about John Hudson, and this is many years ago, this is end of the 80s. So um, at the time, John Rutzon was not in the, I mean, I remember John Rutzon was not even in the, in the history books that, that I was, uh, we were studying, <coughs> like for example, the Tafuri history of contemporary architecture. Rutzon was simply not mentioned. Yeah? Whereas Kenneth Frampton was um, open our eyes to it. So after we finished the studies and we went back to Spain, we had the chance to become editors of an architectural magazine. And so in our second issue, we started with this image that you see there. No? It was the house in Mallorca that, uh, I, that became for us a, um, a whole reference about that. Uh, that our story uh, with the connection to Utsun con continued along the years. We, we participated in exhibitions. I took an exhibition, I mean, I found an exhibition in Copenhagen at the beginning of the 90s. I took it to Madrid. We did it in Madrid. Later on, we participated in doing a, a study, in this case, about the Silkeborg Museum. Etc. Etc. So there was uh, a connection to Hudson. Obviously, I was special interested in meeting Hudson, and finally I did it. Uh, uh, I forgot exactly the year, but you see that my hair was not quite so white, though a bit, a bit already. And Hudson was extremely kind, as he used to be, as well as Lynn Hudson, uh, his daughter, who helped us to find the right moment to see his father after several years in Mallorca, trying to see him, etc. Yeah? So, um, uh, and, and eventually, I, I had the chance to really visit most of the built work by Hudson. Um, not in Kuwait and so, but yes, in Australia, in, in, in Spain, and in, in obviously in, in Denmark. Yeah? So, and so this is simply a very brief introduction to, to uh, that is behind probably the reason um, we were very kindly invited by uh, Nacho Ritalin and others to the exhibition that you have here. But today I would like to talk about our work, and our work um, um, has been developing uh, along this last, uh, now I would say 30 years, um, in different places and different countries. Uh, very much, obviously, linked to Spain from the beginning, which is our place. 
but from a certain point of view and also by chance in Germany where we have an office in Berlin where we, I'm a professor in the university since the last 13 years I think and eventually through competitions because I have to say that our work is almost exclusively a, com a um, consequence of a competition so the way we work is always connected to this idea of constantly trying to learn through this constant experiment of, of making competitions yeah? which which is um, the reason these works are in different places um, and different cities. So today I use this term of the city, art and language because I selected a series of, a series of projects yeah, in which from Utson in a way, yeah, the way Apollon reacts to a certain place uh, and in, this is somehow the beginning of the, that triggers the idea of, of the project. But there are also uh, the, the ones you see up in the upper side uh, are the buildings that we did in the last years. They are built, they are published, they are eventually also in the exhibition, some of them. Um, the others are basically projects that we have um, in process, except one that has been finished uh, one year ago. Yeah? So the rest are buildings that are uh, the, uh, an expression of what we are doing now, yeah? uh, even though they are not, they are not finished. Yeah? And as you see, there are in, in, in Spain, there are in Germany, <coughs> there are in France and in Estonia, uh, which is the building we, we recently finished. All of them connect to this uh, uh, place as the origin of the idea that triggers the whole thing. And in most of the cases, this place is very strongly uh, determined by the, by the city, the urban condition, and the landscape. You know, this is something that is somehow common <coughs> to the different projects. The other thing which is common is the connection to culture and to the arts. You know, all of the projects you will see are, um, uh, in, in some cases, contemporary art center, uh, connected to, the, to um, archaeology, to avant-garde, to painting, to theater, uh, to writing or, or to music. Yeah? So there are all cultural projects. This is what they share. I mean, they, apparently they are different. They, they, they have different origins. They have different even visual expression, but they share the, the way they are connected to all these things. Yeah? So uh, I will start with a project that uh, it's already in, built many years ago, or several years ago, I mean in 2010 it was inaugurated, open, but it, it was a very important project for us. Yeah? It is this connection to a, an archaeological landscape, one of the most important uh, archaeological sites in Spain, in Córdoba, in southern Spain. This is the old Arab city of Medina Talzara. This old Arab city was hidden in history, forgotten <coughs> or concealed under the earth for centuries and was rediscovered at the end of the 19th century. So the archaeologists have been one, 100 years working. Uh, what you see this in this infrared image is the only part that has been discovered up to now, this sort of 15% of the city. The city was a very clear city, this sort of double square, perfect, almost perfect double square, except on the north part because of the mountain. So our project became, uh, and I'm not explaining it in detail, simply explaining the, the concept and the idea which is behind. Uh, this constant uh, uh, sort of dialogue between our interpretation of our architecture, which is let's work like an archaeologist, not as an architect. So instead of building a museum, let's find it below earth. Yeah? And this uh, constant reference between the uh, archaeological site and the building are there. The building, the building is organized. Uh, uh, along this uh, series of courtyards. So the, each different courtyard has a different condition and even dimension. Um, and finally, the building itself is analog to the dimension of the old Arab city. It's, all, it's again this sort of double square. It uses one single material as, as, as it happened in the old city. Uh, in, in our case, it's this white concrete below earth so that when we were in site supervision at the same time the building was being built, it was appearing in the same inversion of the idea as the archaeologists were doing nearby. Yeah? They were finding also the city. So these are simply a collection of images of this building that 
for us was quite important in the sense that we learned very much about the connection to the place, to the site, to the ground, yeah? the platform that we learned from Utsun so, so very much. I, I recognize the influence of Utsun and also other <coughs> Nordic masters as Alvaralto to whom we had an, another type of connection. But um, in, in these different ways, yeah? these images are always comparing the ruins of the city that you visit with the museum um, uh, in which the main pieces are exhibited, where there is a lecture room like here, where there is a cafeteria, where the archaeologists are working. And when you see the building from the outside, from, the, from above, or in a drone or something like this, you see that it's a, a simply a platform which is connected to this uh, agricultural language of southern Spain. So, so this um, idea uh, uh, of how to relate to the past is another main theme for us in, in our architecture. In the same city of Cordoba, um, in, the, in, the, in the proximity to the most important building in Cordoba, which is this um, one that you see on the upper left side, which is the mosque, the old mosque of the, started in the 8th century. And, uh, and in the 10th century, there was a moment when the city uh, that you saw before was built. It was one of the main capitals of Europe, this, this city uh, ruled by the Arabs at the time. So in nearby, what you see here, we won this competition for this contemporary art center. And this contemporary art center to us became a, a sort of, again, personal dialogue or personal interpretation of this amazing building, which is the Mosque of Cordoba, which is about repeating a single element. It's a pure combinatorial idea. You have a double arch, you repeat it infinitely and then you, you, you achieve this uh, amazing architectural space. The same thing with the, with the um, Arab uh, jealousies and geometric model patterns. Yeah? So uh, we uh, won that competition at the time with this model that you see here. I mean, it's how um, the architecture of these uh, mukarnas, uh, uh, which are these you know, ornamental elements that you see from the Arab times, if you make it like really uh, on a whole different scale, they can become architectural spaces, yeah? architectural construction and expression. So it's a very simple geometric pattern. It's an, it's an hexagon, which is divided in three hexagons. If these three hexagons are uh, uh, 150, 19, and 60 square meters, and when you rotate them, etc., you are able uh, with a very almost biological law <laughs> to to combine them in different ways. No? And, and this is also an idea that I remember through reading what Utzon said about Alvaralto to connect, you know, how these variations of one single flower, one single element uh, become always different and always the same. Yeah, these are the exhibition spaces, and below you see the uh, ateliers for the artists of this art center, and above, sort of an internal street. So the section really expresses this idea of this large-scale uh, ornamental element that has become architecture in a way. Yeah? It has become a, um, so the, the model from the beginning to the intermediate state to the final construction became a, a whole process uh, in which each detail was a consequence of these uh, <coughs> grounding ideas. Yeah? The building is in front of the Guadalquivir River, and um, in the distance you see this sort of very large, um, in, in not transparent building, because everything is happening inside. The building is not for contemporary art in general, it's more for video art, visual art, so it doesn't need the presence of the natural light. Yeah? <coughs> The exterior has a completely different uh, materiality. It is, it is done with this uh, light uh, white uh, concrete in which a whole theme of the facade is in contrast with this rough interiors that express this idea of a sort of a factory of art. Whereas all these geometries of these small elements of, of the ornamental Arab themes suddenly become spaces where the roofs and the way this section brings the light um, are really the protagonist, yeah? and in, in, a, in a whole number of different scales. No? But what appears to be equal above is completely different 
in section. The section is bringing the natural light from above. Uh, so the roofs, like in happen, it happened since we started to be interested in the world of Futsal so many years ago, started to be a theme for us. You know, the roofs is um, not only how a building is covered, it's sometimes the very origin, is a section, is a, is a light. Um, and, and therefore, it, it expresses the way the building is, is conceived. The building is now this uh, lively art center in which many different expressions are taking place. And bas basically, it's conceived as a sort of a container, a sort of a rough container uh, or, or a sort of a factory uh, uh, where things can be done. Outside, we developed this facade with a German uh, office, Realities United, where each of these elements of white concrete becomes a sort of a pixel, and therefore, in the distance, the building which is in front of the, what you see, the, the building on the, on the right of the image is the, the cathedral that has the, the mosque below, yeah? so there's always this connection of the building. And during the night, the building uh, becomes a sort of active, um, um, dynamic facade where the artists uh, express uh, their own um, works, as you, as you see here. Yeah? So, this, of these buildings that I'm trying to select of these past years, not so long away, but at least 10 years finished, uh, 10 years before, or some of them 15, uh, 12 years before, etc. There was an, a very important one for us. This is a Moritzburg Museum in, in Germany, in the city of Halle. And it was like that also because that opened to us unexpectedly this possibility of working in, in a different country. And, and by chance later on, it became also a place where we have our own office and we have developed my teaching career, etc., which is in Germany. This is uh, Halle, a city one hour and a half south from Berlin. The city is not so well known, but it's a historical city. You see the, the center of the city, which has been r rather well uh, kept, which is very unusual in Germany mm, uh, because of, obviously of the, of the war. And you see over there uh, the place of the old castle. This castle is called the Moritzburg. It was one of the most important castles in the 15th century when it was built. It has a long story of the of wars, etc., especially the, the, um, in the 17th century when it was destroyed by the Swedish uh, uh, and, and two wings were destroyed. They, it became a ruin. It was called the ruin. In, 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 and uh, there was this competition uh, to uh, transform the two areas that were a ruin since 300 years. Uh, into the new extension of this Moritzburg Museum, which an impressive, with an impressive collection of uh, uh, German expressionists, especially, and also modern uh, artists. Yeah? Uh, so for us, it was all about the ruin and the roofs. And the roofs, again, that you see there in the rest of the city, and, and that are very Nordic, like in your country. Not so much like for us in Spain, where the roofs are usually not the theme, yeah, and in many cases even horizontal. Yeah. And be, yeah, besides, it was the paintings of, of, of the German expressionists, especially of Feininger, yeah, who was living in this castle in the 1930s and was painting these now famous Halle paintings, like you see here, the painting of the, of the, of the Cathedral of Halle or the paintings in the, in the old town of Halle. So we want to go to the competition with this idea of let's make a roof only. The, the roof uh, is the element that is placed uh, almost floating uh, in the old ruin, and therefore we achieve the new spaces. So basically the scheme of the competition, uh, this simply roof on top of the empty ruin and the corner tower, uh, uh, where the, what it was missing was the whole idea. The building was built, as you see, leaving the uh, exterior walls rough um, with, a, with a stone that was since the 15th century there, and hanging with this contemporary light structure with no columns hanging from above. Yeah? So all the project is about this dialogue, again, between the existing old structure and the new this in-between spaces. I think architecture of what is in between is quite important. The new spaces that are hanging in the boxes, then there are new exhibition spaces as you see there. And again, the building expresses this very strong idea uh, that Utzon draws so beautifully in this uh, sort of sketch, which is 
like a declaration of architecture, which is a platform and the, and the cloud. Yeah? So what is floating above, in this case, uh, this large structure of, of this aluminum uh, roof, and what belongs to the earth and to the history which is below. So the roof is uh, uh, this uh, sort of connection to, to the idea, but also to the geometries of finding it, the painter, but also obviously to the roofs of, uh, of the city. No? And it appears like a, a very contemporary element, obviously, that, that expresses nevertheless that it doesn't, that, that is new. I mean, maybe in some 50 years it's taking away, but the ruin stays as it was, yeah? which is an important thing when working in the historical um, uh, buildings. Yeah? So, and the reference which started the project became sort of the leitmotif of the whole uh, process. This building, which is here in the exhibition, became again an, uh, for us uh, one of the <coughs> key points. We had a difficult, extremely difficult project of working in the historical substance. This is a city, one of the most beautiful cities in Spain, in the Basque Country, San, San, Telmo, uh, San Sebastian. Yeah, and in San Sebastian, in this area that you see there, in this limit between <coughs> the landscape of the hill that you see in the mountain, and the sea, and the city below, and this edge where everything comes together, is where uh, the competition was launched to extend an existing museum, which is basically what you see below, you have the model over there, but uh, uh, which is below, which is the, um, an old common uh, uh, monastery of the 16th century. So the building uh, asked for almost double the square meters uh, for the new exhibition spaces, temporary exhibition spaces, all the services that the museum needs to do. And then we have the mountain, which is, which is behind. So then we, we propose this very linear building. The building is somehow establishing the limit between the natural um, sort of landscape of the mountain and the urban landscape. No? So this limit between the city was expressed in the building itself. And in the models that we were working uh, with and building like in, the, in the office, this very large model to test everything. So the facade started to become uh, a very, very important thing because it was not only about how is the facade, what material, no, it was really that the facade should express this leading idea that the building was in the edge between the natural and the artificial. So uh, working together with two artists from the Basque Country, Ferran and Otero, and working, and working around with them in these <coughs> uh, rocks that you see by the sea, uh, rocks that have been eroded by water and, and air and the wind. And, and now you see the green coming in. So the idea came how to develop this uh, cast aluminum pieces. Each of them is really a work of uh, a unique work in a way repeated many times with done with the with this Juan Ferran Otero. So it's cast recycled aluminum. So it's it's something that is done one by one and it's a sort of a thick element. And then in some cases a green would come in a very in a way artificial way, yeah, in order to express this point of the building. So in the distance the building is is a rather um, volumetric expression of the place. Related, if you see on top of the mountain, you see also these military constructions of the, of the 18th century. So it somehow recalls that idea. When you go closer, you see that the perforations that are variations of this single element that has different, you know, there are actually four types of, of, of panels, only four. But depending on how you put them together, it suddenly breaks the, the monotony, which is a quite interesting thing about, about it. Yeah? And then inside, again, this in-between spaces express this sort of white concrete with this um, uh, new exhibition areas. The building itself is always establishing, because we did also the restoration of the old church and, and and the convent you know, of, the six, uh, of the 16th century. So the building, even though in a complete different language, but it's, it's placed in parallel to the old building. So there is always, well, we try always to have this um, rather personal interpretation of, uh, of the new intervention and the, and the old. And new and old are always placed in a very <coughs> particular point, or almost touching one another, like you see here. Uh, the building, where the building uh, comes together with the other one. 
So in the exterior, the building became sort of this sort of art installation in the city, yeah, by, together with, with the artists I mentioned before. Uh, but not only that, the, the building became a, a very lively plaza in this amazing place where you see the sea on the right, the mountain, the military buildings, the, the, the convent, and the new building we did, and the plaza. No? Everything is, is somehow a special place. Or an, and this facade that is um, not a green facade. I mean, there are many green facades. I mean, this is a special way of interpreting this limit that we wanted to do. Now, in Lugo, this is a very simply I show it with a video, because in Lugo, um, Lugo was an important building, uh, much smaller. <coughs> Lugo is in, in the northwest of Spain. This is Galicia, yeah? a different Spain, and green, even in the middle, in the much, you don't see it so much. And uh, in, a, in a limit, again, between the urban, this is the old city. The old city has an amazing Roman wall, yeah? one of the most protected and, um, and complete Roman walls. Yeah? And over there, uh, the, so the city decided to do this, they call it a museum of history, but um, in reality it's sort of a, it's, it's a sort of a visitor center uh, where people can go there and get the information about the history of the city and then go to the center and see the rest. Yeah? That was basically the idea that, that was behind. Yeah? Um, so the building for us became an interpretation, it was in an industrial area. This industrial area was demolished partially already and that was. So this area of the old industrial area, the ruins of the walls, these are the walls of the city. Not the ruins, I mean, they are very, very finished. Uh, the industrial area that to us uh, was also recalling this area of the, of the structures. This is an image of Bern and Hilabesche that you know, but, but there were these sort of industrial elements that disappeared. So it was the origin of our idea. We wanted to work only with one single element. The single element is this cylindrical structure uh, made of, in this case, of Corten steel. And uh, with positive and negative cylinders, uh, we were able to create uh, this space. And moreover, uh, we proposed that the building should be not a building uh, uh, in a place, but rather a park, a green park, and in the middle of the park, the building um, would appear. So this is simply mm, to show uh, in a, uh, maybe a, a, a part of the video only because it's only to, because it sim simply shows from above this situation. Yeah. We use this curtain steel. Uh, um, it rains very much in Lugo. I mean, it's known in Spain. It's green. This is a park we did on the left. Um, and we use it in order to simply leave it age in a natural way. Yeah? The cylinder becomes a theme, so it's a sort of positive and negative element. Sometimes it goes down to the earth. To what extent uh, my personal interest in the work of, of the Silkeborg Museum was there? It's a completely different thing, obviously. <laughs> But uh, I had in mind always this idea of uh, how a building below Earth can interact with this situation that you see there. Yeah? So each of these cylinders either are simply functional elements like elevator or stairs, or they are really the big spaces that connect the exhibition spaces below. During the night, the, the, the way of the, the night, artificial light of the, of the park is included basically in these sort of lanterns. So, because this uh, day appearance is obviously the opposite during the night, where, where you see the structure and the way the building is, is built and conceived. So the building, in, in a way, uh, recalls uh, the idea that it was a starting point. This is for us always quite important in architecture. The idea in, is, the, is the element that ties everything together. And this sort of poetic approach at the beginning is the one that leads to the decision about materials and, and the, the different moments in the process where the building becomes difficult. Uh, if everybody understands what was it in the origin, then it's easier to, to be able to take it to the limit and to, and to be built. Yeah? 
I'm going to, work, uh, to show you now these other projects in which we are basically working now, or except one at the end, which is very recently built. Yeah? Because in the last years, uh, our work has been more in, in outside Spain, in different places, also sometimes in different scales, though by one reason or another, <laughs> in most of the cases, there are cultural buildings or, or buildings that are related to the arts or to, or laterally or directly. This is a, a special case. This is Hamburg in, in Germany, yeah? And this is Mont Blanc, a Mont Blanc that probably <coughs> everybody knows. This is an industrial area of Hamburg, again, like in Lu. It's called Altona, so maybe some of you know. And uh, probably Mont Blanc, you know, or everybody knows that this is a famous pen, uh, the, the founder pen, and that some of them so well known, and so uh, like this Meisterstück, as it's called, and so on. Um, what, what maybe not so many people know, and I didn't <laughs> when we were invited to this competition, is that Mont Blanc is originally from Hamburg, where I thought it was. France or, or Switzerland, maybe, <laughs> but uh, but the factory was originated in Frankfurt, uh, one, uh, sorry, in Hamburg, 100 years ago. Now it becomes it belongs to one of these super big um, funds and so on that owns also Cartier and other how many other things. But the originally is it's in Hamburg and in, it was built in Altona. So the competition was asking for. They call it now Mont Blanc House, in the competition they called it a Mont Blanc Museum. It is a, a museum about writing, the art of writing, but it is also at the same time a sort of a brand presentation of the company where they show their, obviously their pens and what they do. And uh, uh, they also spaces for lectures and all these uh, elements that are parallel to the theme. So, but they, what they asked in the brief was, um, we want to, you to represent the identity of Mont Blanc. <laughs> this uh, word identity is very slippery <laughs> in any sense when you talk about politics and many other things. What is identity exactly, especially if it's a company. But, but to us, it started with uh, these images. And the first, Mont Blanc is Mont Blanc. It's a massive of Mont Blanc. And they use it also in the, in the company. And second, obviously, is the quality of the, of the objects. They <coughs> beautiful and precise objects that they design. But on the other hand, it was not only for us about the identity of the company, it was about the place again. And if the place was an industrial area in Hamburg, well, it was an industrial area in Hamburg, it's Altona. And these are the factories of Mont Blanc that you see there in the image. Uh, so um, the building uh, that you, we were, well, this is the main building of the factory. We were given this area in front that was up to now a, a parking. And we were, we were six uh, office, uh, six architects from different parts of the world. And we were completely free to, to uh, about the position, the shape of the building. Yeah? So, but we thought it, it shouldn't be only about a sort of a fancy building in front, but it should somehow relate to the factory itself. Uh, so we proposed this idea that the building should simply close the front of these different buildings that are behind. And somehow, it, in a way, it, it transmits an image to this part of the city. And it, and it moreover plays with an important idea for us, which was sort of, again, the origin of the theme. Let's see, let's conceive the building uh, as, as they sell their objects. <laughs> and so the, in, in a way, the idea was when you, when you get, um, uh, or you buy, or you get a present, if you're lucky because they're expensive, <laughs> of one of these more blanks, uh, you get a case. Yeah. Basically, always a black case, yeah. simple. And when you open it, then you find a beautiful uh, uh, object, which is a pen. And if you are curious and open the pen, you find even more. You find the, the detailed, precise uh, uh, um, technology that, I, that is behind this, these objects. So, so I, when we presented our idea, we said we are going to build a cage, and, and this uh, uh, outside is going to be a very simple black, black box, not so simple at the end, you will see. And inside it will, be a, uh, it will show the complexity of the of the project itself that you see are all these public spaces of exhibition, of cafeteria, of uh, lecture areas, uh, etc. <clears throat> so the section of the models we were building expressed this sort of um, com uh, complexity inside of spaces that are connected one to the other with this main 
sort of dome space in the, in the entrance that you see here. So you see this section, you see that this very simple box is actually a complex architectural uh, series of spaces with spaces in between with the, with the dome which is cut and the light, natural light is coming from above, etc. etc. So uh, these were the renderings of the, <coughs> of the competition, of the different exhibition spaces, the, the spaces where they exhibit their objects and the history of writing, which is the light motif always the history of writing, the, the cafe and, and the open spaces below. And the facade, the facade uh, was, it, it had, and it was to be, it had because we decided the black box. It was this case that you get when you get uh, a Mont Blanc. But it also recalls in the shape that you see there in the rendering, this, on one hand, it recalls two elements in parallel. Yeah? It, is, it is about when, what you do when you write or you sketch. But it's also somehow the, 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 the Mont Blanc uh, sort of profile. Yeah? Or, or skyline, yeah? So um, the black facade will have the possibility of uh, transmitting uh, light uh, or projections in some events if they, they want to do it like this. Uh, the building has been developed in the last year, so it's really about to be finished. Actually, I have already, uh, it's in, uh, the date, <laughs> it's supposed to be the 3rd of March, the opening of this building. Uh, in, nevertheless, I cannot show a facade yet because it's not yet finished. It's a very strange thing you will see. But the facade is a, a quite interesting thing. You see there, it has been developed. Working in Germany mm, has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, disadvantages definitely there's a, a rigid system and everything is full of norms. Advantage is the precision where, where, where you get when, when, for example, a facade like this is done and the many tests that we were doing. So, for example, what you see here are mock-ups um, uh, in order to get the right quality of this um, uh, um, concrete prefabricated, the right quality of the black, of blackness that we were testing, the possibility of the light, etc. The building, uh, I, uh, hopefully uh, next time I will show it complete. Now I only tell you, I show you a couple of images of the last visit a couple of weeks ago. So the interior is very finished, as you see, is on the right, and, and the rendering that they show in, in the competition. The exterior, nevertheless, uh, was like this two weeks ago. Uh, yesterday they sent me photos of the first panels that are coming. So it's a building outside. Uh, down. I mean, and usually you finish a building outside and then you, the last days you finish the interior. Here they're doing it different. The interior is almost finished. The outside is finally coming now, the, the, the exterior facade. Yeah. But the idea definitely was uh, how we won the competition is we did this little model for the jury and then it was exactly the same size of a pen and when you open it then you see the, the plan of the, the the, the building inside with the different spaces and so on. Uh, now, in Germany, we are working in another quite interesting project. Yeah? I mean, and it's also a sort of a selection of the buildings we did in the recent past and, and those we are working here now because they are really challenging, the Mont Blanc for obvious reasons. Now, Dresden, Dresden is, <coughs> you know, the, if not the city, you know the name because it was this, it was called the Florence of, of the North, like <laughs> before the war. During the Second World War, it's famous also sadly because it was one of the most terrible, you know, bomb, uh, bombing areas where the city was completely destroyed. So, um, and we are building here in an 18th century building that was existing only in the facade, the main facades. The uh, quite interesting thing, you see it in the name, the Archive of the Avant-Garde. This is a, a very interesting project. I mean, I start nevertheless with this image the, of this, um, of Canaletto. You know, you all know Canaletto in Venice. This is the nephew of Canaletto, also called Canaletto, <laughs> Canaletto the Young, who painted like his, uh, so well as his uncle, famous uncle, actually the, the paintings of Canaletto, Bernardo Bellotto are extremely valuable in all the museums in the world. But it's, it was also very interesting because he painted so well, like I don't know how many, 20 or 25 uh, uh, images of Dresden in the 18th century, that when Dresden was completely destroyed in the Second World War, they used in many cases uh, the paintings of Canaletto to try to rebuild, as they did, the center of the old city. In any way, 
Uh, in this image of Canaletto, uh, you see it there. Uh, this is an image I took when we, in the, we did the competition, or a bit later. <coughs> no, later, because it was already in, comp in construction. You don't see it very well. But this building there, over there, it's called the block house. This house, <coughs> that, uh, this building that was like a guard, entry building to the city in the 18th century. And it was under construction. To me, it was extremely <laughs> at, uh, you know, interesting and unexpected to see that when Canaletto was building this build, was drawing this painting, the walls of the house were built and the rest was empty because they were building it. And now, uh, you don't see that, this is the image, this is a, a, a zoom in of Canaletto, and this is our building uh, some months ago when, when we were building, uh, work with, uh, working with it. So it was this sort of inversion of history, no? The, the, it was being built and it was empty inside. Now it's going to be built by us inside and, and, and the building was there. Yeah. So this is a, a very interesting collection from this man this person who is um, um, Egidio Marzona, who is an Italian-German collectionist. I mean, this, uh, he has uh, his, I don't know how old, already close to 80, but since he was 20-something, he has been collecting and collecting anything about the avant-garde, 20th century avant-garde. So it starts in 1910 or whatever and ends up in the 60s or 70s when he considered that was the end. Um, any kind of object and artwork. So it's an amazing, he, they, he has more than 1,200,000 objects. That includes, uh, obviously, many magazines and books and paintings, and, and, but also artworks and, and real paintings and furniture and uh, industrial um, design objects of the 60s and so many things. Yeah. So, uh, and so he, uh, he started also with this idea, uh, with these uh, uh, isms, as they were called at the time. And he has this amazing collection in different places. So he got to an agreement with the state of, of the city of, of the state of Saxony and the city of Dresden in order to um, have them build a building for his collection. I mean, this more or less uh, known system in which a collector lends or, or, or sells, I don't know, the, the real situation, the collection to the city, and the city builds a building for, for it. Yeah? So, and so the competition was in, this is in the historical area of, of Dresden. You know, what you see below is the famous images of Dresden, of the Zwinger, of the cathedral, of, and exactly on the other side, uh, which was the entrance to the city in this, at, at that time, there was this building that originally was going to be a double building because it was sort of the, the, uh, the gate to the city. That was the idea. The buildings were supposed to be like you see them below too. This um, didn't happen, it only started. So the building was at the end not two, but only one and it was extended. Um, um, so it became a public building in different uses during the 18th, 19th and 20th century. Yeah? What you see there, here is an image of the 19th century. Mm, uh, of the so-called blockhouse. Uh, here, this is a photograph of just before the Second World War, which is mm, um, modified from the one below, but keeping obviously the main structure. And during the Second World War, mm, we know what happened, but this building at least kept the, the exterior walls. Yeah? <coughs> the, the interior was completely destroyed. During the times of the uh, German, the East German, government, the DDR, they did a renovation and they put some new building inside, which had no value, obviously, uh, because the competition asked to take it uh, out uh, and, and to really consider the building as it is. This is a plan of the original building. This is a competition that we presented. For us, it was uh, a very straightforward thing. Let's, the idea of the archive is that it is a public archive so that you can visit it. It's a sort of a Schaulager uh, in, in German. Yeah, so a place that you can visit and you have to uh, obviously have a very big area to, uh, with all the security conditions for the, for the elements of the archive. So our proposal was let's consider this void, let's include this sort of parallel gallery 
uh, simply leaving completely free the ground plan. The ground plan should be a sort of an extension of the exterior um, you know, public space. And then let's hang the, the, the whole archive, literally hanging with no columns, with no elements. And this uh, heaviness and, uh, of, the, of the building, of the archive, uh, has also a reason. If not, we will never probably win the competition even with a strong architectural space because it's a, it's a, it, uh, and the reason is that the Elbe, the, the, the river, really has very, very hard, um, how do you say, floods from time to time, and it had 15 years ago, it was a terrible one. So, so the idea of having the archive above and not below <laughs> was obviously very well accepted, even though it makes it more expensive. But uh, that uh, created, that generated this building. Basically, everything is around this sort of floating cube uh, of, of concrete, and then the exterior spaces or the surrounding spaces are always open exhibition areas, even though you will be able also to go inside. So the ground floor becomes almost empty, only the stairs and elevator and, and can be organized in many different ways and will be organized in many different ways. Whereas the uh, intermediate gallery is what you see surrounding, the center is the archive. So it's sort of the, um, it's not a secret place because it will be uh, accessible for small groups uh, that will be able to look. And you see the section of the building, uh, bringing the light also from above, uh, the working models <coughs> in the office where, where, where we have the floating element and the um, and rendering of the, um, of the competition. The building is now really in an in not quite advanced, but in an intermediate one. So I have only one image, but it's interesting for us to, to see it like this again. No? It's basically the concept of the idea that was the origin of the competition is um, what we can more or less see now. I mean, the whole cube is being built and, and one day we'll take all the scaffoldings and then it will hang, <laughs> hopefully. <coughs> Now, a different museum, yeah, and here we are in Spain, yeah, uh, and this is a building, a project we won recently, one year ago, or a bit less than one year ago. This is in Catalonia, this is in the north of Spain, in, in, a, in a place called San Feliu de Guixols, a small, a small town, not so small, but uh, very linked to a beautiful coast, this coast that many people know as Costa Brava, yeah? <coughs> some of you know. Yeah? So the building is really about the coast, uh, the building, the, the, the San Feliu is really about the coast. But if you look again, for whatever reason, uh, we find ourselves very often in this in between the landscape and the city. Yeah? There is a limit there that you see there between this uh, already natural landscape that comes down from here down to Barcelona, which is. Uh, 100 kilometers below, uh, and then there is a space. Again, a comment. You know, what do, do we have with comments? But uh, several of our projects were old comments that have been transformed into museums. Yeah. Um, and if we, if I show before this view of Dresden, I, I let's uh, I like to show this uh, one because it shows. It's a it's a painting of of the collection of Thyssen. Thyssen is a very well, you know, the museum Thyssen probably in, in Madrid, and this is sort of the Catalan collection of Carmen Thyssen, who is a widow of, of, of the uh, Baron Thyssen originally, uh, the one who built the collection. Yeah? So in any case, uh, when you see this image for the 19th century again, that I like to see, well, I see this, you don't see it very well, but this is the, the position of the, of the um, monastery. The monastery is a monastery that has different phases in, his, uh, in its history from the deep medieval times, I mean, uh, 10th century, 11th century, until extensions of the 18th century. Uh, I'm not going to explain it today here in detail because I'm going uh, mostly, as you see, ex <coughs> to explain the ideas that are behind our projects. Yeah? But um, it's still with this image of the ruin in some parts, and it has been renewed and reused not so well in, in the last years for different uh, exhibitions. Yeah? But behind, which is an interesting part, uh, you see behind there is this sort of parking and half wall, and this um, uh, area, and this is an interesting part for us when we enter the competition, to see in an old historical plan the, uh, that the it was going to be the cloister. Yeah? I mean, usually 
in these um, comments, or almost always there was a church and there was a cloister surrounded by all the cells uh, all the, of the monks. So you see the cloister, but actually it was never built. So this is what is now a parking lot, and it was built only two elements of, the, of it. So our proposal, which when we won the competition, was, as you see here, this sort of square in the middle, built exactly the shape or the footprint of this cloister that was never built. And it becomes again an inversion of the idea. The cloister that was to be empty, surrounded by building, is now going to be uh, a common space, this common area that is going to organize a rather <coughs> complex functional uh, system where we uh, um, will restore uh, the, the original uh, convent, where the main collections are going to be placed. Uh, but in this space, you see the historical plan below and the, and the footprint above. Uh, in this, histo uh, in this uh, historical place, we'll have the collections, and in the center, we'll have this sort of common spaces. Because the museum, I mean, this is not Madrid or Barcelona. This is a small town that is very lively in summer, but not so much in the rest of the year. So uh, it is supposed to be also a place that will uh, be also sort of a cultural center that will have many other activities linked to the Thyssen Foundation that is uh, going to run it. Again, this is the same story as in the, as in the Thyssen Madrid, by the way, with the building by Rafael Moneo many years ago, or as in the building I show in, in Dresden, where there is a collector that gives its uh, or lends uh, its collection uh, if, this, if the administration or the state of the city builds a museum for them. This is the same story. Yeah? I mean, the, it's the city and the, it's a sort of an agreement, so hopefully, because it's not yet uh, signed, an agreement between the city, which is small and has not so much money, the Catalan government, which has a little bit more money, and the Spanish uh, Central Ministry of Culture, what's supposed to have a little bit more money. And if they put it together, they will build it, and then this uh, Carmen Thyssen will lend the collection to this, to simply to understand how it is. So it's a uh, sort of complex uh, agreements that if they work, will finally, mm, uh, eventually uh, be able to produce that. For us, it was very interesting to have also the garden behind, because the green slope become, is a beautiful sort of romantic garden, which will be part of the cultural center. And then the platforms that you see, and the cloister, Sorry, sorry. The, yeah, the built cloister that plays with this idea of a, of an orchard, something that is it's it's not where you you use it below because the building is somehow used below, as you see here. Uh, uh, but it it becomes at the same time this sort of space where you have the entrance connection to the old building, the cafe, the the shop, the all the all the exhibition, uh, all the sort of storage area of the museum. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I'm not explaining it in detail, but yes, um, telling how mm, again a very complex idea tries to be solved with a very simple theme uh, that once it's understood helps to the whole process. So um, I hope it will be if we build it. <laughs> I hope it will start. So the idea that everybody understands that this is a cloister. Th this was supposed to be the cloister. This is the dimension. Therefore, everything has to be. Um, in accordance with this idea, yeah? and some images of the interior structure that uh, without any central column, so that it really, uh, even if it's built, it's only a roof, uh, it has no columns in the middle, in order to express this idea that it was one day, at least in the Im imagination of the architect of these medieval times, it was one day going to be a cloister, though it was never, and it was only a parking lot. Yeah? So. These were the model of the of the building, and uh, the project in which we are involved uh, in the last year and a complex one, yeah, and also a big one, yeah. This is the <coughs> city, as you see there, City du Théâtre in Paris, yeah. And this is um, a, a long process of competition in which we were involved. There was a, this is the area that you will see a bit later in the north of Paris. Uh, we received this invitation with 10 other architects from, again, international architects, French and different parts, 
to send to have a first phase for an idea of what to do here for this Cité du Théâtre. Um, after a first phase, uh, we ended up being three, and these three during nine months. This is a, quite a strange system and uh, well paid, but nine months. <laughs> Uh, we had to develop and have a sort of a process, a um, dialogue competitive in which we had to have several meetings with the client with all sort of, you will understand now why so many meetings because the client is quite complex. This is an image of uh, the wall of Paris in the 19th century, early 20th century, you know, which is uh, pretty much the same shape uh, that when you go up Paris, uh, to Paris has the peripherique, uh, when you go driving from the airport, you know it, more or less is it. It was um, the wall of Paris, but not a medieval wall. It was a 19th century wall that was um, built uh, at the time. Uh, and this, in this north area in Port de Clichy, this is the area where the <coughs> building uh, is placed. Actually, if you look here, this is a place uh, of, the, of the Port de Clichy, and if I zoom it, you see in this um, area a very large building and a very large wall. What you see here is the rest of this 19th century wall uh, of Paris that was demolished at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. It was demolished because it was not really, well, at that time they demolished everything, but besides it was not, it was a defensive wall um, that they, it was decided to take away. So in only a few places of Paris, you still re recognize it. There is another place not so far, and, uh, and then this area that is here. And below, uh, you see the buildings, uh, uh, you see below the red line, which is this, this piece of wall of Paris, you see these large buildings that you see below that are the objects uh, of the competition, which is this, um, they were this very large halls built by Charles Garnier, the architect of the opera, in order to do the scenographies of the opera. I will show it now. So this is a wall the, of tears, as, it, as it's called, in the 19th century, before it was demolished. This is the Atelier Berthier of Garnier. These are this very large building, very powerful, uh, um, stone buildings were, and, and with uh, steel uh, roofs, uh, structures that were used to build the scenographies. For example, you see these guys with, when they were preparing whatever opera scenography that was going to be uh, done in, in obviously in the, in the Garnier Opera in Paris. <coughs> so the building now, uh, when we enter the competition, uh, and still now, is as you see it here. Yeah? So um, the buildings which are below are partially used still by, for some theater uses, some of them in not use. One part is a, a, a experimental theater of Le, Le Odeon in Paris. And behind you see a very large building that maybe you recognize because it's one of these buildings by, um, recently built in Paris by Renzo Piano, which is a justice palace. Of, so, uh, and in front, on the left uh, area, there's a very large park. If you have been to Paris, this is an area where many in, in architects have been building recently interesting and not so interesting, all kind of housing and a big park, but also some, some of them are very well known. So the three main institutions uh, of the theatre in France, and, and I would say in Europe, some of them, as you see, La Comédie Française, which was founded by Molière, and, and it's Le Odeon that is well known everywhere, and the, and the Conservatoire, they have their own uh, obviously very well-known theatres in, in, in the centre of Paris, but they wanted to extend uh, the, uh, this, its, its spaces in order to have this modular experimental theatre space, and they joined together with the umbrella of the Ministry of Culture. So it, was, it is a very ambitious project, and again I have to hope that it will go ahead, because it's already more than one year, two years in process, um, and, the, and still pending on the finance decision. Yeah? But uh, our competition uh, was again trying to focus on how to relate to the existing structures and how to express an idea, a concept that is going to lead the whole process uh, in which we are nowadays involved. Yeah? So if this is a wall, the rest of the walls uh, are the ones that you see there. The buildings, obviously, uh, 
are kept. We, we, we keep the buildings as, as they are, even in the, in the simply intervening in, in them. Uh, but we had to extend really the program very much. There's a lot of spaces for, um, um, uh, how do you say, test, well, I forgot the word now, anyway, and, and rooms and, and rehearsal rooms and uh, offices and the school of the conservatoire uh, uh, and the students and many, many, many places. So we decided to put all this program in a new building, which is the one you see there. And this new building takes exactly the shape of this small world that nobody knows in Paris that is there and nobody, or nobody, most of the people do not. Um, in order to express leaving it below that, hey, this was one day the limit of Paris and you didn't know. This is a place that you can visit and this is how it was history, etc. And then, then the next very important thing is that most of these theatres are below ground, below this green uh, platform. So we started to imagine ourselves when doing the competition that we were uh, transmitting an idea that is connected to the theatre itself. Yeah? The protagonists are the buildings of Garnier. Uh, the stage is this, the scene is this sort of platform that you see green, and then you have the sort of big curtain behind, which is, so there is a certain scenographic expression of the building that simply was there because the only thing, I mean, the shape of the world was there, the buildings were there. What we added is a platform, the green platform, in order to connect it to the, to the park that you see on the other side, yeah? Um, okay, this is a, the competition that was after many, <coughs> many uh, in-between stages, the model that we presented. I have to say that we love models <laughs> and we have many types, the ones that we do in our office, the ones that are done like this, uh, very large and so on. But um, that was especially good uh, in the final decision uh, with the uh, with the people of the theatre, yeah, because the people of the theatre love models so much as we do, yeah. So they they work with models, as you know, they, when they do the scenographies and so on. And so, uh, so the model itself was planned to be uh, not only showing how the building is and how <laughs> it appears there; it was also in order to show how it can be open. So, so these are the images of, of the different parts. No? Uh, so everything could be open and you can look inside and where the, uh, each of the different places are going to be done and so on. The main space is the central one. The central one was conceived from the beginning for us like a public spy plaza. The, the idea of uh, every project needs in a way, in a point of view, especially a, a public building to, to produce public space, yeah? besides the Lodeon and the Comédie and so on. So this becomes an open plaza, covert, yeah? that is that you can go in uh, even if you are not going to go to any theater. From here you can enter <coughs> to three different places and you can also connect to, to the exterior as, as you see from here behind. So there was also this relation between the park on the left and this, keeping the same level, etc. The plan is, uh, this is one of the many plans, uh, it's not even the last one, where it was every time there, there was something moved, changed, adjusted and so on. There are six theatres, the biggest is 600, meter, uh, 600 people, the smallest uh, 100, uh, 150, uh, and they are organised, you see the colours, yeah? the, 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 the red colour is the Comédie Française, which there is also a big rivalry. Yeah? Comédie Française are supposed to be the number one ever, but the Odeon is also very important, and they, they, were, they are the blue ones. And then the yellow ones are the, the Conservatoire, which is uh, less um, uh, influential in a way, but all of them uh, come together with these common spaces, where the, which are the green spaces, which is this public open space, and then the um, media tech and the uh, restaurants and the, well, I, I'm not going to enter into this extremely <laughs> uh, complex process, but um, but the building you see here, we go below ground in two areas in order to achieve the height of the theatres below the garden above, because the idea is that this sort of stage is a garden above. And then in the other section you see this sort of building leaving the wall, the black thick element behind is the wall of tear. So, images of the competition, 
of the model of this um, situation above. The facade of the building, uh, new building, is um, a very open facade that has this sort of green uh, element in order to connect to the park in front. Yeah? It's a southern facade. It becomes a sort of a, uh, an in-between zone that captures the energy of the sun because this is ex it's exactly oriented to the south that obviously during the winter, even if nowadays it doesn't snow anymore, but the image shows it like this, it loses the, the green and allows the, 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 the light to come in. The back uh, facade is extremely uh, sculptural because there was a condition. Behind, we have the building by, by Renzo Piano. Not because it was Renzo Piano, but because if it's uh, the, the Justice Palace and the police, central police of Paris and so on, it is not allowed to look through windows behind. So that makes a very, very it's a translucent facade uh, with, 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 that gives it a very, in a way, sculptural appearance, as you see there. Yeah? Uh, whereas in the front, as you see, there is this expression of this um, um, idea of an urban scenography <coughs> and that was behind our project. So, uh, so at the end, the project is somehow always trying to recall this idea of, that is because and for the theatre. Yeah? Uh, it has a certain scenographic presence. Um, it has also in its uh, technique that, or this, where we decided to do this cable facade a reference to the way uh, uh, traditional uh, structures are done in the theatre and obviously it has the connection to this idea <coughs> that it is the wall of tear, this old wall of Paris. Yeah. So let's see if this building goes ahead, hopefully, <laughs> but it is uh, one, uh, we're still in, in the planning process. Yeah? Uh, and I will end up with this building, the only one of these recent buildings that has been finished, which is the um, Arbo Park Center in La Olas Magia in, in Estonia. Here you will hear some sound behind. Yeah? And uh, I think it's important to, to listen to the sound in the presentation because this was an extremely interesting opportunity when we won this competition to, in this beautiful landscape of Estonia, um, so far from us in Madrid in Spain, uh, but a bit closer to you but nevertheless mm, uh, in a very different landscape to work uh, in this process. The landscape is an amazing place. It's this um, um, wood uh, forest of pines of 25 meters high. Yeah? Um, and the building uh, or the project and the competition and the whole idea can be explained with this connection between landscape, music um, and architecture. To see what is this connection is always, in my point of view, a personal interpretation. There has been a lot written about these arts, but how to interpret the work of a master like uh, Arvo Part and work together with him directly makes it quite different. Yeah? I don't know how many of you know Arvo Part. Listening to his music, probably you recognize it if you don't know it. He's uh, one of these living masters Actually, I didn't know it, but he's, he's the, the living composer that is more interpreting the world. I didn't know at, at the beginning, though I know his music. Yeah? So it becomes uh, uh, this sort of um, expression of, uh, of, the, of the very essential in, 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 in music. And, 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 and actually working with him made us learn to understand more than what we expected when we interpret the work and did the competition. Yeah? What you're listening now is Spiegel and Spiegel, one of these famous and very well-known pieces that has been very much interpreted also in, in films and so on. When we entered the competition, we received all the... Um, there was a big competition, there were 75 architects or something, at, uh, and at the end, uh, 25 in the last selection. We got this sort of spiral, huh? when you see it's the uh, Arbo Park's work, the, his, his, his memories, his recording, his archives, etc. But we started also to look to... I knew the music of Arbo Park, especially some pieces, but not, not what was behind. No? So we, we started to really try to find out and learn. No? 
the sketches of Arbopada are, are, are extremely beautiful artworks. Huh? Like he, when he was doing this uh, tabula, he's again expressing the spiral. So when we uh, decided as after several tries what to do in the competition, we somehow went to this essential connection that was a personal way of trying to see what is common in the music, generally speaking, and the music of Arvo Part and in our work. And we found it in geometry. Yeah? Uh, you could think that listening to this music, you also can imagine geometrical figures, or at least we as architects, but most of you are thinking are architects as well. So uh, uh, we started with this scheme in which the spiral of different pentagonal forms were going to produce these courtyards or patios. So, in a way, silence in the work of Arvo Parat is quite important. Silence in architecture could be understood as void. There was a series of uh, sort of polygonal spaces in connection that would create uh, voids in the middle of this impressive and beautiful forest. Yeah? So the building appears in the middle of one area that had less trees. Some of them have to be taken away, but we were replaced nearby. And it really plays with this uh, concept in which a building has no beginning and no end. So a building that should not have a facade or three facades or four facades, it has only the roof. Uh, the roof again, like for us, became so important after, after knowing the work of Utzon, and I mention it very often, the roof became the beginning of the project, how this element appears on top. The intermediate models we were building somehow became also itself a, a process in which building the model, as you see here, you have a final model here in the exhibit, but these were several working models in which in the process of being built, they also recall some strange even musical instruments. You know? There was in the whole process of working in which we had the chance of work with the Arvo Part family and with himself, Arvo Part, many, play, many elements became to, to become unexpectedly connections uh, that we didn't see at the beginning between music and architecture. The building is a, a cultural center, it's a foundation. Uh, what you see here in this yellow color is the places where the, where the people work, I mean, the people of the foundation, the staff, uh, whereas the whole center becomes this sort of uh, continuously connected spaces with a protagonist on top, which is the, the auditorium, and with spaces for library, for um, teaching, for uh, uh, cafe, for, uh, you see the image of the of the roof itself becoming like the element that ties together this complex system in which every part becomes a geometrical element in relation to the others. Yeah. The roof itself, when you see the section, is also folded. It's not a flat roof or it's not an inclinated roof. When it's folded, it really reacts as well to spaces like the one we are here now, for example, the auditorium that needs high uh, ceiling, or the more domestic spaces, if you like to say it like this, of the, where the people is working, the, the offices. The exterior has a, a sort of a filter system, uh, and it has also a tower, you will see. It was a very a particular request by Arbo Park that the building should have a tower and be able to go up and look towards the sea. Yeah? So the whole uh, process uh, made us aware also of how architectural representation has a close relationship to musical notation. Yeah? What you see on the left is not, a, is not a nice drawing that we did in order to make it look nice. It is actually one of the many layers of the AutoCAD drawings of the facade elements you know? that, uh, that somehow in the, in the process of being built uh, were uh, showing us also this connection or this relation between the uh, natural world and uh, the architectural one. At one point, one day, and this was during the process, 
we started to put together the partitures, the, the scores of Arbor Park's music that you see there, and to overlap our architectural drawings. And suddenly it was like a sort of an, a beautiful discovery, you know? We saw that architecture has its own, its own rules. It, it, these are, again, layers of the AutoCAD drawings uh, with, and, and the other uh, parts of the scores. And nevertheless, they establish a strange dialogue. So we started to understand how this um, dialogue connection between the different arts has many different uh, interpretations and many uh, cases, uh, unexpected one. Yeah? So uh, one day we prepared the site, uh, uh, as you see, we took all the lines of the site to see where the building was going to be placed. And that day we were with Arvo Pat, obviously, uh, and he's a very, very, you know, kind, extremely kind and quiet person. He would never, uh, you know, say anything against uh, something of a building, of the building. You no, know, he was extremely respectful. Yeah, but um, he started to to look at the building, and after one hour going away, we saw that he was somehow a bit nervous. No? And he, finally, he said it. No? He said, "Well, no, no, I, I like it. It's the, everything is perfectly." Apparently placed, but in the distance over there, over there, I, I can see the roof of a house, and I would prefer to move the building to um, a little bit in order not to see the house. That was a very interesting moment for us, yeah, definitely, because we know he started to say, No, you know, because I, I ne I'm never happy with my compositions. At the end, I have to go back or go back. We said, yes, architecture is not always uh, so easy to go back, but the building was not yet done. But this is actually that day. It's not something that I prepare only for the lecture. So we started to, 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 to move the, the building in the site in order to displace it. I don't know, I don't remember. It was 12 or 15 meters, which is 12 or 15 meters. No? Then a tree has to be taken away and some others. And then, and then especially for us, the courtyards were very well placed, everything was in its place, and when, when a tree makes it move, one thing moves everything, and he understood it perfectly, but anyway, at the end we did it. So we changed the position, and finally the building uh, found its right place, and the day we were there, the, the, everything during the process, uh, and it has to do very much with the personality of, of this great person and master, Arbopat, had to do with making everything special. Everything was special. The day that we were with here, or with him or not, the day the architects come, the day Arbopat was walking away alone, the day we started construction. You know, we know that this sort of events are done generally here or there. The politician comes and speaks something that he's not aware of what it is and goes away. Here, everything was special. The day Arbopat said, "This is the building was already with some walls, as you see here, but." Um, and there was a choir with one of his um, compositions. Um, and so we also, and this is something we were very happy after, because after many years working um, during, during the beginnings of our career, there was a very close relation we had with the construction site. And with the process of working in Germany, in other countries, this becomes more complex, many other agents uh, that, that you lose, or I feel we have lost a bit of this direct connection. Now here in, in, in Estonia, everything was like in Spain uh, the years before, no? everything, uh, at least in this building. I don't mean Estonia generally, I'm sure not, but working with Arbopat, yes, yeah, so the, the building was growing uh, in the middle of this absolutely beautiful place. Uh, for us, they were very moving uh, sad supervision days, you know, because um, in Spain, well, I would say it never snows. In, in Madrid it was a terrible snow this winter, but usually it's not. Yeah? Uh, and here, the, during the construction, there were really, really cold days in which the way of building was, was really a, a whole thing, uh, especially in this amazing landscape. Yeah? So uh, the building was finally ended and built, and. Um, on time, also the presence of 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 Arbo Park himself um, somehow tied together all the other uh, people, like the construction company and the, and the engineers, etc. Yeah? So the building appears in the woods, as you see here, with this presence of a roof. I mean, the roof uh, is made of this 
um, um, sync uh, with age, uh, also with the time, and, and the connection between the filter that defines this uh, facade or exterior enclosure that has no beginning and no end, it starts to establish this sort of uh, dialogue with, with the trees. Yeah? Uh, to what extent uh, do we learn that from Alvar Alto? I think very much because we, I mentioned several times Hudson, but we have been, we have been a story also with Alvar Alto from the days we were students. We, later on we were in seminars of Alvar Alto, later on giving lectures. Finally, they, they were so kind to giving us the Alvar Alto uh, medal some years ago. And, and, and I always remember this very special way of, of trying to deal with uh, with an architectural element uh, that recalls or establishes a reference with the with existing, the interior is a, a flowing of um, a sort of a flow of spaces that are interconnected. There are different uses, but um, some of them are for exhibitions. Some of them are again for sort of public events. Not so different, actually, in many senses to, to the Hudson Center. Yeah, uh, there, there is also a place where. There are fellowships where students can, uh, or not students, or scholars can, or artists can go there for three months. So if you're interested, this is a beautiful place to be, if you get it. Um, and there is uh, the library, there is uh, the working spaces, etc. Though the, in a way, protagonist, in a way, is the auditorium. Yeah? The auditorium is uh, relatively small, it's for 180 people. But the whole design of the space uh, was a, a, whole, a, very, a very interesting process. Yeah? For example, you see the roof, the, the, the ceiling, the, the, the acoustical ceiling. That was developed with a very good acoustical uh, physician from Barcelona, a very good friend, uh, who, who, who was working, designing this dimension of this element in sort of, a, sort of to make, to to cheat the space. The space needed to be in a big, a big bigger, but we didn't want it to be bigger for architectural reasons. So this acoustical ceiling helps to create the, the, um, the quality of the, of the sound in relation to the frequency of, of the, what you would say, medium frequency of both of the work of, uh, of, of Arbo Part. Yeah? So again, there is always this connection between the exterior and the interior, which, which is also marked in this very large window, like you have here. Yeah? This idea that you, you can close it, as you can also hear, uh, if, if it's needed for some special uh, musical event, but in most of the cases it's open. No? And so the building was, uh, uh, had a beautiful opening, uh, obviously with Arbo Part and with his uh, presence, his music, um, um, and, and nowadays it's in, in complete use. This is a, the image from the outside. When you see the roof, the roof, uh, you see it from the tower. The tower is also a special part. The roof shows also that in one of this system of courtyards, there is a strange element. <laughs> you see there, and this is a, a very small chapel. Yeah? Arbopard and his family, his wife, are extremely religious in a very, very personal way, you know, from an orthodox mm, mm, religion. And so he wanted to have uh, the chapel, and that was part of the brief of the competition. Our proposal of mm, building the chapel outside in the woods, which is for us the logical thing, was not accepted because he thought he wanted to have it there. You know? So we then play with this idea of saying, well, let's imagine that the chapel was there and we build a building around. No? So the chapel is made of another material. It's a sort of uh, uh, simply concrete chapel, minimal chapel, where, uh, which is somehow surrounded by uh, all these different elements of the, of the project. The geometry is based on this pentagonal shape that is so common of the natural world, you know, in all kinds of plants. And that creates a very, for us, inter interesting geometrical system of possibilities in which they grow in, in different connections. So at the end, the, the geometry of the pentagon is not only the courtyard, it's also the shape that you see um, of the building outside. During the night, the building becomes a sort of strange uh, 
uh, illuminated place in the middle of the, of the dark. You know that you are also very north, but uh, there, are, there are even more. So during many year, many months in the year, it's um, it's uh, it's dark, and so on. These images that we were uh, receiving from a drone, because sadly we could not fly on top, uh, were also very significant of this idea. This connection of the shape of the land and the sea uh, uh, was uh, uh, something that again I remember from Alvaralto and, and I believe that when one grows like we did and has the chance to build in different situations, many of our experiences come back and back. You know, and this, there is always this idea that architecture is very close connected to memory and this is the way I, I see it. To finish, uh, to mention the tower. Uh, uh, there was uh, another very unexpected part of the brief of the competition. It, it was said, we need all these exhibition spaces, an auditorium, a cafeteria, a library, and a tower. The tower was, uh, the only reason is that Arbo Park would like, would love to go up and see the sea in the distance. So, so um, the towers became for us also again an interpret how to do a tower. It was not only a stair and going up. Uh, it, it, it really, on one hand, it takes the exact shape of the pentagon. It's like saying, this is the clue of the, of the whole geometry of the building, the footprint of the tower. And this is a sketch on the right of Arbo Part of these geometrical uh, uh, combinations in which he works. And so we developed this idea of an helica, a helical tower based on this Fibonacci series in which uh, it's growing like a helical uh, uh, three-dimensional mm -hmm. building. It was developed later on with the, with the engineers, as you see here, for, uh, building in, in different uh, sectors in, in order to be produced, that finally created this basically empty space. I mean, it wanted to show also this, this very mm, deeply conceptual and essential reason. It, obviously, it has a small stair and an elevator, uh, but at the end, it is based on this idea that when you go up, then, as you see in these images, you can see the sea. Yeah? So it was the rendering of the competition in which you took an image of Arbo Path walking around. And the building, uh, as it was built, so in a way, it was a whole process in which, again, the strength of an idea uh, was helping us and helping everybody to understand the, the whole process in, in which we wanted to express uh, this connection, deep connection, not difficult, not easy to explain between landscape, uh, music and architecture. Thank you.